الراق ابن روحان التغلبي alright so who was Barak ibn Rohan <laughs> people for this I think I need to one moment I need to pour myself I think a little drink oh uh oh Oh, right. I, I gotta wait for that to all. Too much fizz in that. <laughs> it's probably a sign. Okay, that's all right. I like it. I like it. I like it. There you go. That's good enough. All right. So let me just put this down. Right now, people who was Barak ibn Rohan at Taghlibi. We've spoken previously of the great kind of battles in pre Islam, and we spoke of Zir Salim and the Harbul Basus, which lasted for 40 years. Zir Salim, obviously, whilst they're young, and his older brother Kuleib, which triggers that whole thing. There, he would have been their cousin, as in the uncle's son, or I think some people put him as their uncle, and others have said his son, their son, but much older than them, though. There was this person by the name of Barak ibn Rohan, but they, they are there as well, but he's just senior to them in age. He was somebody that was not only one of the most epic poets of um, of Arabia in his time, one of them. But he was an outstanding kind of warrior, outstanding, and, you know, very kind of noble as well. You know, we spoke previously of these Sa'ali, and we spoke of these Fataks, some of these people on these crazy, like, psychopaths. <laughs> they just approach someone and say, all right, get ready, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> he was... He was like a very noble person, and Barak ibn Rohan. And the whole of Rabi'a kind of rated this guy. He was from that tribe of Rabi'a, yeah. And they all rated him. And he was specifically from Taghlib. But obviously, ultimately, they're all part of Rabi'a. Now, what happens is he, in his, he falls in love, as one does. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, with a woman from his tribe known as Layla bint Lukays. So Layla, she's also known as Layla al-Afifa, the modest Layla. And, the, and we'll come to why she was called modest. But he, he obviously falls in love with her. She falls in love with him. This becomes a kind of like a proper... That, and everybody in Banu Taghlib knows about this. And he, remember, he's a don. He's like what, somebody... People feel proud that he's part of their tribe. That's how... So nobody's got a problem with the love story here. This love story, this one, this one, all good, man. All good. So uh, now... Right, so what happens is the father, Lukays, obviously speaks to... is related to... Uh, Barak ibn Rohan he's related to him as well in the tribe they're all kind of related and he says it's kind of known it's one of those things that it's putative like without being expressed people know he's going to marry her and even the father of Layla al-Afifa he's cool with it he's like mm, yeah in fact when it's mentioned publicly he even says yeah yeah of course they're going to marry everybody knows they're in love, man. The law, the law, the law. So, right. So it's all happy days for this person. Until what happens is, you know how you have social media today? In that day and age, you had the kind of people who would spread news as well. It was either through poems, often through poems. Sometimes just you had the gossipers, you know, like the, the aunties. <laughs> <laughs> they had their fair share of neighborhood aunties as well. It's like, oh, 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 oh. proper falcon-eyed vision. And so 
what happens is Layla was incredibly beautiful. So people knew that about her. I mean, her beauty was kind of known. So people started talking about it. So, so you know, somebody said, oh, you know, from, oh, my God, from that, from Rabia, oh, my God, Leila, Afifa, she's so beautiful and she's so wow. And so people are speaking about this. So this news somehow reaches the, the royalty in Southern Arabia. So one of the, the kings of the Southern Arabian tribes, it reaches him somehow through people, you know, as... Like, as time goes by, he hears. So now that it reaches the royal courtyards, so you see royalty, they rub shoulders with royalty. So, you know, they, they're kind of like chatting. So now it becomes news in the royal circles that there's apparently, you know, people praise the beauty of some woman, Leila Bint, uh, you know, Lucas. Okay. Leila, he catches it. Yeah. So, the, so he gets curious. So as it happens... The, there's an as it happens, it coincides with uh, an occasion where Layla's father, Lucas, he is traveling to Southern Arabia on some trade, and he goes into that part where this king is, and because they had their kind of the Hemir kind of kingdoms and stuff, so he goes there and he's uh, he's trading and he's in that royal courtyard thing, and he's kind of and the person says, "Oh, is this?" This person, he says, oh, he says, I've got business with you, yeah. <laughs> he says, business, hey, yeah, business. He says, what, shall we resort to the office? He says to him, look, listen, I've got better than all this business deal. I've got a better offer for you. He says, what's that? He says, oh, ain't you the father of Layla and so on? He says, oh, I'd like to marry her. So, and some people say he was trying to marry her to his son, but whoever but he puts a proposal. So the father says, you know, but she's going to marry Barak. But then, then again, this is royalty. Huh? <laughs> royalty is royalty, man. <laughs> it's like royalty is royalty. Bank balance. Yaar. So he says, you know what? It's a deal. A deal, eh? Yaar. Deal, 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 deal. So now he comes back and he comes back to Bani Taghlib, he's, he's where they live. And they lived in around uh, these people in the kind of nudged region of Arabia. So he comes back and, and he tells, you know, like some people ask him, oh, so what happened? You know, somebody comes back from their journey and they've got stuff and say, how did it go? And he says, yeah, he says, oh, oh I've also, by the way, set up uh my the marriage from Layla with you know the, the king so some people say ah oh, I thought she's engaged to Barak he says oh well you know now now I've I've said it now so this news now reaches Barak so Barak obviously he's like you gotta be you gotta be this uh, 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 some this gotta be a joke he goes straight to the dad Lucas and says, Look, some people are saying this, this can't be true. That you know, you've because and the dad says, Well, my son, you're right. I had said she would marry you, but you know what? It is what it is. He said that look, he proposed, and to be fair, I think that's noble, it's better for her. That she marries royalty. I haven't got nothing against you, my child. <laughs> it's like, it's not you, right? You're a good man, good man. But he, better, even gooder man. <laughs> so, so he says, you know what? I'm, he says, there's royalty at the end of the day. And, you know, I think it'll be better for her future. So, Barak is fuming, fuming. <laughs> He says that this, obviously, he says, you know what, I'm, he says, I'm asking you to reconsider. He says, no. He says, forget this. He goes straight, finds Layla. He says to Layla, he says, do you know, this is what your dad has said. So she says, I've, I've heard as well. He says, well, this is nonsense. You and I, 
are going to elope. We're going to elope. <laughs> the good old Dilwale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge. This is the good old DDLJ. <laughs> right, so the classic Shahrukh Khan. So he says to her that we're, we're leaving and we're leaving right now. You're going to elope with me. And you know what the best part is? <laughs> Nobody's going to stop me. And and fair play, nobody would stop Barak. I mean, he's he's like the the rated absolute warrior of whole of Rabia. I mean, nobody would be that stupid. So he says, look, nobody's going to stop us, and you and I are leaving right now. And guess what, people? Guess what? This is a true story. So guess what she says? Way before. Dilwale Dulhenia Le Jayenge was written. She's, she says that dialogue that Kajal is going to say <laughs> millennia later in Bollywood. She says, Nahi, that Babuji kya kehenge. <laughs> she says that this will bring shame to my father. Allah. She says, Nahi Raj. <laughs> that only Babuji ke ashirvad ke saath, that only with the blessings of my dad can I get married. I will not run away and bring shame onto my family. I said, I can't do that. She says, I, I love you, pero no puedo. You know, this is, I can't, this one no es posible. You know, I can't bring shame onto my family. You've taken care of me. Don't know. Look at the, see this. Confusion in the loyalties, you know, the loyalties. So, obviously, Barak ibn Rohan is, he's just completely heartbroken. Because he says, look, this isn't fair. This was the one thing I wanted, and everybody knew it. And just because I'm not super rich, they married you off and she isn't even running away with me because she doesn't want to hurt. And it's not like he wants to hurt their family either because they are ultimately good with him and he's good with them. So heartbroken in this way that he is, he switches from Dilwale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge to Devdas. <laughs> and he sets off for the mountains on his own with his alcohol. And this is it. He doesn't want to, you know why he's heartbroken. He says, I don't want to know the world. Bahar all of you go to hell. And he just he just becomes this recluse momentarily. He's completely gone. He's just on his own. Doesn't want to meet people. Doesn't want to. Days go by and the days turn to weeks to, you know, months. What happens is tribal fighting breaks out. Because tribal fighting at that time, anything could trigger it. And from the northern kingdoms, there was uh, there was uh, there were certain tribes known as Tai. So people probably all heard of Hatim al Ta'i, a very famous, generous person. We'll speak about him another time, pre-Islamic. But he's from that tribe of Tai. So they were in the northern kingdoms. And Qudaa, we spoke of Qudaa previously. They have this fight which breaks out against uh, Rabi'a. So, and especially against the, these, uh, you know, uh, Bani Taghlib and uh, Bani Wa'il and all these people. So, so this fighting breaks out. But Qudaa, as I mentioned previously, are such a large number of Arabs, so large. That I, if you remember last time, we said that when people were asked who are the majority of the Arabs, they said Masha'at Qada'a. That if Qada'a claims to be Adnani, then it's this. If they claim to be Khatani, then it's that. Because Qada'a were just huge in number. So Qada'a and Tay, and Tay were ruthless as well. Those of you that recall a hadith that the Prophet wasallam said that in the end of times, they or he's not end of times, he said a time will come when uh, peace will prevail or, or safety will prevail, that a woman will be able to come from the northern kingdom all the way to visit uh, the Kaaba 
uh, without being harassed. Like she will come on her own. This is also used by scholars to say that, look, women can travel on them. There's nothing wrong with that. It was a safety issue. But the narrator of the hadith, and this is in Bukhari, he says, and I thought to myself when the Prophet said that, so what about the what about the tribe of Tait? Because the tribe of Tait were ruthless for being bandits. They were these kind of like bandits along the way that would uh, always harass people. So Tait and Qudaa, so you've got this kind of bandit kind of culture and these huge numbers they combine and they've attacked Rabia and there's this fighting going on and Rabia are getting rinsed they are getting slaughtered just because of the sh it's a numbers game like for every hundred they've got like a thousand they've got ridiculous numbers and they're just slaughtering and slaughtering and these people are just dying so what happens people start thinking where is Barak Ibn Rohan <laughs> Where's our warrior? Our Don? <laughs> He's that Bechara Duki Atma. He's in the mountains just on his own. So they send people, please, please join us. Please, please. He says, Look, get lost, get lost. I'm not joining you. I'm not joining you. I don't want anything to do with any of you guys. You guys all bewafa <laughs> You know, it's like you only want. You only have a purpose, like from people. It's just selfish people. That's all you are. And so he doesn't join, and they continue to be getting. And so what happens is this warfare lasts for considerable months, and it would have certain interim breaks. So whilst this is going on, people are worried that oh, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get obviously looted by these, you know, northern kingdoms. The northern tribes, they're gonna be kill they're killing us, our numbers, you know, they're reducing our numbers, they're taking our women, they're doing all this, taking slaves. So during this, Lucase thinks that you know what, I might might as well send Layla to be married because right now, the way this is going, we're all gonna get killed, and she's you know, obviously either gonna get killed or enslaved, and so. I might as well. So he sends a message and, and, the, and the southern Arab king says, uh, the Yemeni king, he says, yes, of course, we're ready. Send her. We want to get, you know, get, let's get this wedding going. So, <laughs> so whilst that king says that, there's this news in the royal, you see, because each platform, when you're on social media, you're being followed by your equal, your peers. See, celebrities follow celebrities, isn't it? It's like that. They, celebrities are not going to be following you like normal people. So the kings rub shoulders with kings and they keep up to date with each other's news. So now this king in Yemen starts preparing for a marriage and says, yes, you know, all this, you know, this beautiful, stunning woman is coming, Layla Al-Afifa. And the reason they call her Al-Afifa is some people say the modest because she refused to run away with Barak. And she, you know, she and she had this Ifa, this modesty for her family. Some people say that's the cause why they call her that. But this news spreads from kingdom to kingdom, like the kings here that, oh, yeah, that Yemeni king is, is doing this. So whilst this news is spreading, it spreads to the northern kingdoms as well. They hear that, oh, by the way, there's a wedding and that's going to take place in the coming weeks of that king. So it reaches the Sassanid Empire, the Persian king. He hears, because the Persian and the Yemeni kings had a, we'll speak about this another time, in, in pre-Islamic Arabia, they had very close ties that the Sassanid Empire and the, the Yemeni kingdoms, the Southern Arabian kingdoms, had a close tie with each other. And this is why there were a lot of Persians that were settled there. And they were called the Abna, because they were sent there by this empire. But anyway, so the Persian king finds out. So whilst he's, he's asking about her, people start really glorifying her beauty. They say, oh, you know, but this woman, Layla Lafifa, oh, Oh, <laughs> oh, Miss World, oh, Miss World ain't got anything on her. So this Persian king thinks, huh? A char. Oh, 
<laughs> it's like this, that pretty. So he gets a bit stirred. Like, yeah. So what happens is he obviously has contact with people and he says, you know what? Hmm. I wonder if I could, if we could get her. So now this incentive has been put out there. So whilst this is happening, Lucase is preparing his daughter Layla to send her to the Yemeni king. And they're going to go from Najd down south towards Yemen. So whilst they're going, there is a tribe that's, that was often in between, which was from Yad. Now, Yad, if you remember, we spoke previously that from Adnan, you're going to have the main branches that come down were these alleged brothers. There were these four. So you've got Mudar, which and from Mudar come, uh, and I'll bring it, bring it up. I may actually have a picture of it. Yep, there it is. Uh, you can see it there that coming down from Adnan, you've got from Nazar, Nizar, you're going to have these four brothers starting on the right hand side, Mudar, which is going to be Quraysh and all these people, Qais Aylan and Bani Tamim and all these people. And then you're going to have Rabi'ah, which we've spoken of, and coming from them, Banu Taghlib and Bakr ibn Wa'il and all of these. But another brother was Iyad and another one was Anmar. Anmar. So Iyad, this tribe, was a lot of them were settled in that middle region. And Iyad, Bani Iyad, had an affiliation with the Sassanid dynasty. So they were often seen as an affiliate tribe to the Persian kingdom. So they got news that the Kisra, the king, is interested in this Layla. So when she's coming through the desert, they kidnap her. So Layla gets kidnapped. So Layla al Afifa is kidnapped now by Yad, who transport her all the way to Persia. And she's now in front of the Kisra. The king of the Sassanid Empire. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I, I'm king. <laughs> he's like, welcome. I am king. I is king. <laughs> so, so what happens is, you see, but you know, and this was like I mentioned that the Arabs generally and especially some tribes like Rabi'a and Banu Taghlib they always had this self-pride remember they were very strong fighter people and it's a misunderstanding to assume the women were weak the women were equally strong I mean they may not have been always fighting but they were a very proud women uh, uh, people as well they weren't this kind of like subdued kind of like they were very kind of confident and very outspoken as well they would, so sometimes people think back thinking they like these kind of rural, quiet village women that were like anybody told them shut up and they just shut up. They were nothing like that. You know, these were not, these were like some, you're dealing with some proper from warrior clan kind of women. So Layla gets taken in front of the Sassanid king, Kisra, and he says, <laughs> very beautiful <laughs> this one so he says look uh, you're very lucky <laughs> you know reverse psychology oh, reverse psychology you're very lucky that i've decided to marry you so she says that ain't gonna happen and he says to her like <laughs> Sorry, what this one? My ear no used to hearing no. <laughs> he says to her, you better watch yourself. And she says very clearly that look, she says, What are you gonna do? You're gonna kill me. You're gonna torture me. She says, You're gonna force me and rape me. Is this what you're gonna do? She says, like, but you can't have me. I refuse. And if you're gonna if you if you if you are that low of a man that you have to force yourself to be with me, then what kind of a king are you? This aren't true, man. This is ego, huh? Ego. <laughs> male ego. <laughs> and then on top of the male ego, the king ego. <laughs> oh, Kisra is hurt. 
obviously now you see remember people of position and people of power it's a huge insult to them that they have to rape a woman like that is such an insult to them because they thinking look i'm this person that everybody wants me if i have to force a woman like look how denigrating and insulting that is to my reputation it's like the legend of the world some kind of celebrity superstar that all women want to be with and he's trying to be with a woman and if he has to force her can you can you imagine that like so you see in cuz in the king's ego this is like that's something like she ought to be dying to be with me i can like i can force her but that's you know that's not kingly to do that so he says okay torture her so he has a locked up so so what happened somebody said kisra simped so hot after a year he's mega hurt because you know then the thing is this you know psychology the thing you can't have this you pursue with even with, with even more vigor like you want it that much more now that why can't i have it so she's now imprisoned in this courtyard so she, i mean in this not courtyard but in this palace there's there's a place where they've kind of got her because they don't put her in a prisoner's cell because she's a woman beautiful woman and remember he's still hoping they're going to convince her so although he's torturing her but not in that sense torture like like obviously they're roughing her up and maybe she's being denied food and then maybe they're slapping her around occasionally and that kind of stuff and she's in these kind of like with the servant quarters she's having to stay there and a prisoner against her will so whilst this is happening her family back you see you pause this and you go back to Rabi'a and Bani Taghlib so the war is still going on they're being attacked by the northern tribes and and the father doesn't know anything's happened right so he it, he doesn't know he thinks she's got married to the southern king the southern king thinks that oh because there's a war going on the father still hasn't sent her because they're not stable enough to send her so nobody knows she's missing so nobody's looking for her because let's say the yemeni king knew then maybe he could have kind of with a royal kind of opened a channel of communication with kisra and said look you know said kisra this one not nice yaar yaar kya kar rahe ho yaar he could have probably said this but nobody knows so everybody is thinking layla is in the other place layla al afifa so they're thinking layla al afifa is there in yemen yemen are thinking oh layla al afifa is in najd with the tribe and so the war still meanwhile it's going on qada are rinsing um somebody said i wonder if it was common for the ancient uh, persians and arabians to be multilingual those were many of them were that had close alliances the ones who had alliances often were so and hence you see certain farsi words creep into arabic as well because of the, them being used so much right so whilst this is happening um the northern tribes like qada atay are rinsing rabia they make a mistake is it mistake galt is a mistake you know sometimes people make a mistake by trying to be good <laughs> see they realize they also have heard of the reputation of barak ibn rohan they think mm, barak don huh? daddy this one <laughs> daddy huh? daddy don so they don't want to they don't want to mess with him to be honest because they knew a lot of their soldiers and a lot of their people they just have a fear in their hearts about him but they were really glad he had abstained from this war because it gave their soldiers much more courage so what happens is they one of them out of this happiness decides to send him a gift to say thank you for abstaining ah <laughs> your ethics huh? ethics so this gift comes to 
Barak is this kind of soul ranger, solo. He's going solo in the mountains, Dave Das mode. He's like just him, his alcohol. He's not, doesn't want to speak to people. He has a little, you know, he's, he's he has a little kind of crew that are around with him and they just live together. Suddenly they get this gift. They're like, what's this about? They go, oh, this is from Tayyip and Qada'a. They're like, why? They go, no, they're thanking you. He goes, why are they thanking me? He go, they go, no, because you abstained. This hits him like an insult. That, wow. You know, that, because remember, he was a very dignified person. That is, he thought, is this the propaganda that you guys are, are you know, or that you guys are spreading, that I'm in cahoots with you? It's like, you guys, it's like, who the hell are you? So he says to his uh, people that, you know what, take, he says, take these gifts back and tell them, that forget the gifts, I am coming. <laughs> I is coming. <laughs> Boy, this sent tremors. Obviously, this had Rabia got so when they heard the news, they were jumping in joy. Because, you know, sometimes it's just the person, you know, that فَمَا كَانَ قَيْسٌ هُلْكُهُ هُلْكَ وَاحِدٍ لَكِنَّهُ بُنْيَانُ قَوْمٍ تَهَدَّبَ You see, sometimes a person holds people together serves as the social clue his presence just knowing that he's there it mobilizes people and this news served it catalyzed the strength in bani rabia and they start to fight and and he comes and he joins them and this fighting is taking place and and all of a sudden the spirit stuck you know, the, the opposing tribes can feel it and they start to back off. So this is going on. So they eventually come to a truce. So th this is what's happening. But we've got to pause this for a moment. We've got to go back to the palace, man, the palace, royal palace. In the royal courtyard, oh, sorry, royal court, Layla Al Afifa, it's been weeks and months now. She refuses to give herself to the Sassanid king. And this is like an insult. <laughs> but she's like one of the servants like that. She's wandering around, you know, doing stuff, cleaning, whatever. She comes across, she's outside the palace because they had to obviously work with certain animals as well and stuff. But this is in Persia. And she sees a shepherd, this kind of like nomad guy that looks like an Arab because you wouldn't really get my Arabs over there so she, she, she calls out to him and she says Hala anta Arabi? are you an Arab and he says yeah she, and he says I'm from such and such tribe like some northern tribe she says have you heard of Barak ibn Rohan and he goes <laughs> Have I heard of Barak? <laughs> Who hasn't heard of Barak ibn Rohan? She says, could you do me a favor and get this poem to him? So the guy says, she goes, it's necessary, it's a must. Please get this poem to Barak. So he says, all right. So she says this line of this poem. She says these few lines that are like, Ala leita lil Barraqi aynan. Fatara, if only Barak had an eye that could see. Ma ulaqihi min bukain wa ana. What I am facing from in torment, from torment and tears. And so she, she, she says, and it goes on. She mentions certain things. She says uh, about her. She, she says that you can chain me, uh, that qayyiduni, uh, ghalliluni, that, you know, chain me, torment me, punish me, whatever you want to do, but I will never kind of give myself to you. And 
she, she expresses that in the face of this, I've already accepted death. So this this poem now she says sends this tells this guy this poem she doesn't say who she is she just says like you know say this poem I mean she sorry she does say that you can if he asks it's Layla but say this poem you have to say this poem now this reaches Bani Taglib and reaches Barak Barak is gobsmacked that wait a minute I thought she's in Yemen with this king she's married she's a slave by kisra the persian king he goes absolutely wild he says that you know what here and now i'm rallying a cry against who <laughs> check this out against kisra I'm rallying a cry against Kisra. Obviously, his tribe and Bani Rabia, they rally around him anyway because he is who he is. And in her poem, she had actually addressed her tribe and neighboring tribe saying that shame on you all, that a woman is taken and you guys, uh, you know, just can do nothing about it. So her, th their tribe rally around him he mobilizes them says let's march up towards this palace let's go we're going north <laughs> and this news reaches out to other tribes and you know it's interesting that at this point they send a they send this poem where he addresses mudar from where tribes like banu tamim and even quraysh are from but quraysh are not at this part of arabia they're uh, in Mecca, but you have tribes like Bani Tamim who are fighter tribes. They were known for fighting, but they send this message to Mudar. And Rabi'a hate Mudar and vice versa. But they say that, you know, Mudar, that if you don't stand up for this, then shame on you. That an Arab woman could be snatched. And, you know, you just basically because of your differences, you don't kind of rise. And they say that if you don't, fine, but shame on you. And he obviously mobilizes Rabia and they move up. To their amazement, several sub-tribes of Mudar joined the expedition just because of this thing that it hit them that, wait a minute, that this Persian kingdom, okay, we, we hate each other, <laughs> but they have, you know, that this is how weak they think we are, that we wouldn't do anything. This is one of the few occasions ever in pre-Islamic Arabia where these diverse tribes actually were united under a cause. And that too, such a noble cause. And they attack the Sassanid, uh, that Sassanid fort and that palace. Now, remember, the Sassanid kings didn't know, the king didn't know this was about to happen. So when they come, hundreds and hundreds of them, they, obviously they start fighting and these soldiers try to fight, but these guys were ruthless. Bani Rabi'a were like ruthless fighters anyway. And then you had Tamim joint them. And all the, and this is one of the times they fight side by side. That the, they actually, the, the, the Persian soldiers, many of them are killed and the others just kind of like crap it. Like they think like, what the hell's going on? Who's he? Well, how are we under siege? So many of them flee because they just, they just, it comes as such a shocking surprise. So they enter, they get into the palace, and lo and behold, <laughs> Barak frees Layla al Afifa and he brings her back. And obviously, this is seen as one of the most, uh, like, uh, pride worthy moments of pre Islamic Arabia. And the, and his uh, and the whole tribe, obviously the father included, they marry him off. It's one of those uh, happy endings that you have to this love story. <laughs> Allah, Barak ibn Rauhan, and Taghlibi and Layla al Afifa, and it's amazing. And this legacy lives on much after them in generations and reaches people. Obviously, this is like over a hundred years before Islam. This is over that. So, but the the story lives on, that this was the, f the one of the few ever occasions 
we it has happened on one other occasion as well, but few ever occasions where the Arabs attacked the Sassanids and defeated them, and it was and they, that too they united so many rival factions of tribes that hated each other under a noble cause that resulted in a in a happy ending and a marriage. <laughs> la la la. I thought it's fantastic. I had to share that with you guys. So wow. so this these are the kind of people. So there you go, people. Love it can have its happy ending. <laughs> so that's way before any of these stories were written. It's amazing. You know, when you read these things, it brings like a more flavored nuance to Islam because Islam emerges then in what nested in this history. And you start to see how all of a sudden different colors and flavors. And it's, it's amazing. I invite everyone to really uh, implore people to study Islamic, uh, pre-Islamic uh, history. Right. Okay. Many died for Layla. Ah, Layla. Yeah, Layla was a... <laughs> uh, somebody said, sounds made up. I mean, you see, you'd think that, but this is it. Often, you know, often that you, reality can be stranger <laughs> and more bewildering than fiction. But many of these things have happened as well. This incident did happen. I mean, maybe certain things, obviously, we can't verify for a fact, but it was a something passed down and celebrated so often. Like this individual was well known and his love for Layla was well known. And the struggle for their marriage was something that became iconic and passed down through generations.